I was the type of drug addict, I could not go a day, I could not go a second without my drugs. They say you can't be addicted to it, but I, man, I've had some days when it was just like I needed marijuana for me to function. Well, I didn't even think of drugs as addictive. I just thought they were just something you did. I didn't know it was, you, my life was going to depend on it. I, I feel very strongly that addiction is a brain disease. I think there's ample evidence, compelling evidence, that there are profound changes that occur in the brains of people who are addicted to certain substances. Weighing in at a mere three and a half pounds, the human brain is by far the most complex organ of the body. The brain processes information about the sights and sounds of the world around us. It is responsible for how we think. It coordinates how our muscles move. It stores and recalls our memories. It determines how we feel about ourselves and how we feel pleasure and pain. The brain also determines how people experience different kinds of drugs. From the rush of pleasurable highs that lure them to use a drug to begin with, to the cravings and compulsive behavior that come with addiction. For scientists like Stephen Dewey at Brookhaven National Laboratory on Long Island and Aaron White of Duke University in North Carolina, the brain has become a central focus of their efforts to understand the causes and consequences of drug addiction, particularly during adolescence. The brain, particularly during the teenage years, is incredibly moldable. It's like a big lump of clay. And every experience that you have helps mold and shape that lump of clay in potentially permanent ways. We, we now know from, 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 from some very recent and compelling studies that the brain changes basically through life, um, but at a period of adolescence is changing a great deal. And it, it's a particularly vulnerable time and a time we need to be very careful. Are teens more susceptible to the risks of becoming addicted? Do drugs pose even greater risks to teenagers? These are not new questions, but recent brain research has provided new insights that may help answer them. For example, researchers have discovered that a part of the brain, called the frontal lobes, is still maturing during the teenage years. The frontal lobes play an essential role in keeping us from making decisions that we're going to regret, and that includes decisions about substance use and abuse. The frontal lobes allow us to uh, think about things beyond the immediate present. We can think about the future. We can think about where we want to go, what we want to do, how do we get there. And while we're getting there, we can control impulses to do things that aren't consistent with our plans. The fact that the frontal lobes are still maturing in the teenage brain may provide clues about the risks of addiction. But other important clues require looking more closely at the cells that make up the brain and how these cells communicate with one another. The brain is an amazingly complex organ. You have probably around 100 billion little cells called neurons. And each of these neurons communicates with up to 200,000 other neurons. These neurons communicate by releasing chemicals onto each other. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters. So if one cell wants to send a message to another cell, it does so by releasing chemicals onto that next cell. And that's how the brain works. And there are hundreds and hundreds of different neurotransmitters in our brains. And each neurotransmitter, we believe, plays a specific role. For example, dopamine is a neurotransmitter in our brain that plays a role in our ability to move. Um, dopamine also plays a role in euphoria, the feelings of euphoria that you might get when you get a test score of 98. You might feel wonderful about that. Brain dopamine levels increase. Brain researchers now use sophisticated imaging techniques to study the brain. At the Brookhaven National Laboratory, they use PET scans that enable them to observe and measure changes that go on in the brain, particularly chemical changes involving the neurotransmitter dopamine. And that gets us back to the point of this program, how our brains are affected by drugs. All addictive drugs are chemicals that affect not only the structure of the brain, but also how the brain functions chemically. When 
I first started using crack, it made me feel strong. It made me feel powerful. Um, it gave me confidence that I didn't have before. I first started using crack, it made me feel good. I felt, I felt high. When people like Sung Mo and Amanda first started using drugs, it wasn't because the drugs made them feel bad. They made them feel good, or at least better, and at least for a while. Addictive drugs have different effects on the brain, but all raise dopamine levels in a part of the brain called the reward pathway. The reward pathway consists of nerve fibers in the brainstem that release dopamine into a central part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. From there, other nerve fibers release dopamine into the brain's prefrontal cortex. It's very simple. Any addictive drug, whether it's caffeine or methamphetamine, will elevate brain dopamine levels. And every drug will do it to a different degree. So for example, a drug like caffeine might elevate dopamine levels 20%. A drug like methamphetamine might, might elevate dopamine levels 10,000%. The reward pathway can be activated in many ways. Think of things that make you feel good. Perhaps a favorite food. Or listening to certain kinds of music. Or a kiss. Or riding on a roller coaster. All these things make you feel good because they temporarily cause a surge of dopamine in your brain's reward pathway. The reward pathway is also important to our survival. We do know that reward pathways are vital to sustaining our life. The desire to feed and get water um, is part of the reward pathway. If we didn't get pleasure or satisfaction from drinking or eating, we wouldn't survive. But addictive drugs can subvert the reward pathway in harmful ways. That's what all drugs do. All drugs, no matter how they work in the brain, marijuana, alcohol, uh, cocaine, uh, amphetamines, all these drugs, nicotine, the one thing they have in common is they all trick the reward system into becoming activated. So you think you did something good when you didn't. At Brookhaven National Laboratory, experiments with rats have shown that drugs can hijack the reward pathway so that drugs become even more important than food. You can train animals to go to a specific environment to get food. And they'll go and they'll get food. You can also take those same animals and train them to go and get cocaine and then give them a choice and they will go to get cocaine. And in fact, they will continue to use cocaine until they die in the absence of going and getting food. For people too, drugs can essentially hijack the brain's reward pathway so that even food and survival take a back seat. You don't have a life. When I was using drugs, I didn't even shower. I didn't even eat. My whole life was evolved around how and where I was going to get dope. I didn't care about anything. My family, my girlfriend, nothing. According to Aaron White, during the teen years, there's a natural dip in the reward system that may make teens even more susceptible to experimenting with drugs. The purpose of that seems to be to get us to want to go out and explore the world and take some risks and, and uh, try some things out and meet new people. One of the consequences of this, though, is that teenagers tend to be a little bit bored. They tend to really want to try new things. Uh, nowadays, some of those new things can include drugs, because we have these drugs around us that activate that reward system. So if your reward system is a little bit dampened, and you're going out and exploring and experimenting with things, and you try a drug, all of a sudden the reward system becomes activated, and that's going to feel pretty good. And if your reward system is normally pretty active, then the drug might not feel quite as good. But if it's dampened and all of a sudden you do the drug, it's probably going to feel better than it would um, otherwise. If addictive drugs all affect dopamine levels in the brain's reward pathway, why is it that addicts often seem so miserable? Shouldn't more dopamine mean more pleasure? There are other things that happen. With repeated use, using drugs actually changes the brain. The reward circuits become compromised. Among other consequences, it means the drug user develops a tolerance to the drug. Tolerance, reduction in the response to a drug after prolonged use. 
That's the dictionary definition. But what does it really mean? Listen to some people who know firsthand. Nothing's like the first couple times when you use heroin, just like any drug. The first couple times you use any drug is, is probably the, the most feeling you'll ever get. When I first started marijuana, it was like, okay, yeah, I could smoke either a bowl or a joint. And then after the years went by and the years went by, it was kind of like, I had to smoke five blunts after six blunts after seven blunts, and it just became a repetitious thing. Well, when I first started using heroin, uh, one bag would last me like a day or two. And at the end of my heroin use, I was, you know, 10, 20 bags. It just went up and it's just, you could never get where you want, you just have to keep doing more and more and more. When people abuse drugs, their reward pathways become compromised in various ways. Alcohol, methamphetamine, and ecstasy are drugs that actually kill neurons in the brain. Cocaine affects nerve cells in a different way, by reducing the number of dopamine receptors on neurons. If you lose dopamine receptors, then you lose the ability to feel pleasure from things. So imagine that a cocaine abuser loses dopamine receptors. That cocaine abuser no longer feels pleasure from things that normally let him feel pleasure. So what happens to compensate for that is they use more cocaine to elevate brain dopamine to compensate for the loss in receptors. So it starts this cycle. As you use cocaine, dopamine levels increase, the receptors decrease. As the receptors decrease, you lose the ability to feel pleasure. So what happens? You need to use more cocaine. Everyday normal things I didn't find fun, like going to the movies or going out to eat. I didn't find that fun. I couldn't even go to the movies. I couldn't even go out to eat unless I was doing drugs. I had to be doing drugs in order to go do normal things. You can, you can see it also in nicotine smokers. Over time, what you'll see is the system accommodates. In, in someone who's never smoked before, a cigarette, a single cigarette may increase dopamine levels 20%, but in someone who's been smoking 20 years, that increase might be 2%. So there's no question that chronic use alters not only the reward pathway, but the ability of the reward pathway to respond. One of the consequences of developing tolerance to a drug can be that the user also becomes dependent on the drug. The process of becoming dependent on a drug is one where you do the drug and it feels good, and you keep doing that and the brain adjusts itself so that when you do the drug, it doesn't make you feel quite as good anymore. But now, the brain can't function without the drug. So when you take the drug away, you feel bad. Now you need to do the drug just to feel okay. So if you talk to a heroin addict, heroin addicts don't get much pleasure out of heroin anymore. What they get is relief. Because without the heroin, they feel horrible. I had to have it. If I didn't have any heroin in my system, I didn't feel normal at all. It started, I started to not do it to be high. I had to do it. Researchers now agree that with continued drug use, changes in the brain can cause major changes in behavior. Drug use becomes central to a user's life. At some point, what started out as voluntary use becomes involuntary and compulsive. The user has become an addict. Addiction, compulsive physiological need for a habit-forming substance. Compulsive, that's the really key word. When a behavior is compulsive, you have to do it. The addicted brain has changed. The way nerve cells communicate with one another has changed. And this is reflected in an addict's behavior. Drugs and the craving for drugs take over an addict's life so that nothing else matters. Family, health, friends, nothing matters except drugs and being able to get a hold of them. I supported my drug habit by prostituting. I would have sex with men every day, every night. I would rob my family, I robbed people I knew, my friends, people I didn't know because I had such, such a craving, such an urge for, for a bag. Stealing money from people, from old people, young people, it didn't matter. Drug, drug really has a hold on you. 
I was willing to do anything to get high. I, I feel very strongly that addiction is a brain disease. In fact, I would take it one step further. In many cases, we see changes in the brains of addicts that are far greater than the changes we see in schizophrenic patients or Alzheimer's patients, which are classically defined diseases. So I absolutely believe that addiction is a brain disease. Recent research indicates that the teenage brain may be particularly vulnerable to addiction. The brain is so moldable by experience when we're teens. It's a wonderful thing. At the same time, though, that's probably one of the reasons that teenagers are more likely to become addicted and dependent on substances, because the brain is, is very capable of learning it very quickly about these drugs. Uh, you learn about the drug and you like it and you think about it a lot and all of a sudden it just takes over your life. That's what addiction is. The body learns that this drug is, is on board all the time, so it learns how to function while the drug is still there. That's what dependence is. So this wonderful thing that happens during adolescence, the, the moldability of the brain, it can actually backfire for us. It can actually harm us by increasing the likelihood that we, we learn negative things too. There is certainly compelling evidence that drug exposure during adolescence increases the likelihood of continued drug use as an adult. And there's some really striking statistics. For example, inhalants. Adolescents who abuse inhalants alone have a 40, time more, 40 times greater likelihood of abusing drugs as adults. So there's no question that the adolescent period, that period when the brain is changing a great deal, is particularly vulnerable to the insult caused by drugs. If addiction is a brain disease, then just as with other diseases like cancer or diabetes, it needs to be treated. But treatment can be difficult because the brain of an addict has changed. For treatment to be successful, the brain needs to be changed again, to be reprogrammed. All of the recovering addicts interviewed in this program are in a treatment program run by Phoenix House, one of the most highly regarded programs in the country. While their stories differ, they share some similarities. All of them felt they lost control of their lives, and all said they needed help getting into treatment. I don't think on my own I could have gotten help because I was in denial. I was just seeing the negativity around me, and I, I wasn't really thinking about my, myself, really. I used to think, when I was out there using, I don't need help, I can quit on my own. Oh, I'm gonna quit using drugs next week. It doesn't happen like that. It doesn't happen. The cravings, the feeling for the drugs is way too strong. Cravings are a huge obstacle to recovery. Long after a person stops using a drug, cravings for the drug continue. Relapsing, or sliding back into drug use, is common. I have experienced relapse in treatment, and it was, it was probably the worst thing that happened to me because of all the treatment that I've been through and then to, you know, lose that because I couldn't handle my cravings. A big reason why cravings and relapses are major obstacles to recovery is that the brain stores indelible memories about how a drug felt. I think one of the classic examples of people who smoke. If you talk to people who smoke, they will tell you that they crave a cigarette in response to a specific environmental trigger, a cup of coffee, after a meal, in the morning when they get up, when they're talking on the phone. So there are certain things that people who smoke associate with smoking. And those triggers, those environmental cues trigger craving. We've actually been able to measure that in the lab. We can actually train animals to go to a specific environment where they know they're going to get a drug. And then when they go to that environment, we don't give them the drug. But when they go there, dopamine levels increase. So that environment triggers a release of brain dopamine. Anytime you, you drink alcohol, there are lots of, of things going on in addition to the taste of the alcohol, the feeling of the alcohol. So, for instance, let's say that you, um, you always uh, go to a certain bar to get your alcohol. Every time you go by that bar, the stimuli, the look of the bar, whatever, is going to trigger the brain to crave the drug because the brain knows the drug is in there. 
it's almost there. It, it, go in the door, the drug is there. Let's go in, let's get the drug. The things that trigger me are, are mainly um, probably my, my environment back at home. Because that's all I knew was the streets around there. Um, it's just basically people and, that I've gotten high with and the areas that I got high really kick up a lot of feelings. I absolutely still think about getting high sometimes. Um, the, the things that I have to change is, you know, they always say people, places, and things. You know, because if I go back, hang out with the same people, if I go back to the same places and the same things, I'm probably going to end up the same place. People, places, things. For treatment to be successful, it must help recovering addicts cope with the cravings triggered by their memories. In an effort to develop better treatment methods, the brain research laboratories at New York University have been working with Phoenix House to study how well the brain can recover from the damage associated with addiction. Using electroencephalograms, or EEGs, to measure the electrical activity of the brain, researchers have found significant differences between teenagers and adults. When we looked at these two groups, the ones that started to use drugs as adolescents and those who started to use it as adults, after nine months of abstinence, what we saw is a great deal of recovery in those who started as adults. Whereas those who started as adolescents showed very little recovery, and in fact, it looked as if the damage done to their brains by the exposure to drugs was irreversible in the adolescents. But these findings don't mean that a teenage addict cannot recover from addiction or that treatment is useless. The ability of the adolescent brain to change and adapt, factors that increase the risks of becoming addicted in the first place, also may help in recovery enabling the brain to compensate for the damage addiction caused. What we all have on our side, whether we're dealing with a stroke or damage from, from exposure to drugs or a head injury from a car accident, is the plasticity of our brains and our nervous systems. And what that means is that when one region isn't working, another region can take on that function. Uh, in, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases. So maybe what we're dealing with here is an acknowledgement of the fact that there's been some irreversible damage and an effort to find a way to rebuild other circuitry. And there's a great deal of evidence that those kinds of, of, of methods work. Everything we do has an impact on the brain. For recovering addicts like Rochelle, Rebuilding the brain circuitry means substantially changing their behavior. I have to change everything I used to do. I can't lie no more. I can't be sneaky. I can't steal. So recovery is hard because all my behaviors were so negative. Now I have to change it into just being positive. It's making, creating a whole new person. Creating a whole new person. That's essentially what Jose Diaz did. A counselor at Phoenix House, he has been drug-free himself for many years. His story offers hope to the recovering addicts he works with and may also be a testament to the brain's ability to recover. I spent quite a few years in prison and it was time for a change. I was tired of being tired. I was tired of coming in and out of prison. June 13, 1986, I was released into the custody of Phoenix House. I became what you call Phoenix House property. Uh, once in a while I look back to keep it simple, but I'm always moving forward. Phoenix House has blessed me. You know, I did the work, but they guided me, like the father guiding the child. My vision that I, I tell my, my residents, my clients, my, my consumers, like we call them, that you gotta get a vision. That man or woman without vision is gonna perish. The opposite of that is men or women with vision who's going to prosper. Aaron White at Duke offers another perspective. His focus is more on prevention than treatment. You know, the fact the brain, that the brain is changing so much during the teen years means that decisions that teenagers make have a direct impact on how they shape their own brains. So I think that the best way to deal with addiction and dependence is to prevent it, not to treat it. If you don't start, then you're not gonna have to quit. There is another trait that the recovering addicts at Phoenix House share. 
none of them started taking drugs with the intention of becoming addicted. When I tried heroin, I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know the repercussions of it. I didn't know that you could get that addicted to it. I didn't start taking drugs to be addicted at all. I didn't even know what addiction was. Thank you.